I'm going to keep my uh, remarks brief because we all know why you're here, to see some fabulous poetry. Uh, I'm Bao Fee, uh, Associate Director of Programs here at the Loft Literary Center. Uh, we have a host of writings, uh, uh, sorry, writings. We have a host of classes for teens, for adults, uh, writing contests, almost anything you could imagine to help uh, writers and readers in our community. We have something to do with it. Check us out at www.loft.org. Uh, and see if anything interests of you. Just get involved with us, be, get engaged. Uh, we've, we're, a mini, we're a Minnesota uh, grown place. This place, Open Book, is the only building of its nation devoted in, in the nation devoted to nonprofit literary arts. So please do take advantage of that. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, the special program, how we're able to work with these remarkable teens as well as DESA. We uh, were given a grant this year to create access and break down barriers to participation to literature for three main populations, new Americans, people with disabilities, and teens. Obviously, teens is why you're here. Um, now, we did focus groups for each of these populations to ask, what would you like to see happen here at the loft? What would you like to take part of? And something that came up again and again in the teen focus group was DESA, DESA, DESA. Dessa. And we're like, okay, we'll get Dessa. Okay, we'll, we'll call Dessa. And we're really glad to have her here. Um, she is an essayist, a rapper, and a proud member of Doomtree, Minneapolis Ascendant Hip Hop Collective. Her most recent album, A Badly Broken Code, was enthusiastically received by NPR, the Chicago Tribune, and Herb. After her last North American tour, the Utney Reader called her a one woman powerhouse. Uh, and her, she uh, is a star whose ascension is rapid and exciting, and we are so glad to have her here. She um, selected uh, a group of teenagers. We had an open call for people who wanted to work with Dessa over the last three days to do workshops on writing and performance, and uh, we're so blessed to have Dessa and her really talented group of young writers here. And so I'm just, without further ado, Dessa's gonna come up here and she's gonna introduce all the young writers. So everyone in Minnesota Teen Writing Conference, put your hands together for Dessa. Exciting. You guys have a full house if you haven't had the nerve to turn around yet. Um, I am probably the least sentimental youth worker that you are likely to encounter. I don't enjoy working with teens just because they're teens. <laughs> Sincerely, I enjoy working with teenagers for the same reasons that I enjoy working with adults. When I've got a group of ambitious, hardworking, talented people who are willing to work hard to hone their craft. So we have 10 such students today. As Bao mentioned, I was able to read through a couple of applications, and of each of them I asked, will you please submit a writing sample? And I read that, and I read it for quality, you know, to see who had some chops that might be meaningfully honed. And I also said, could you identify a couple of skills that you'd like to refine? What do you want to get better at? And I also selected them uh, for people who had identified skills precisely and ambitiously that they wanted to improve. And before we get to the readings, which will happen in just a moment, um, I, again, want to thank you for listening attentively. If your phone rings, I would take it away. <laughs> uh, at 16 and 17, much like at 30, and I presume at 72, in a room of your peers, one of your most immediate objectives is to seem competent, is to create a good impression and is to make sure that socially you're treading water. And all of those ego concerns have to be completely suppressed in a writing workshop because we've got three days and for you to improve quickly, what you need to do is tell me what you suck at, <laughs> right? It's a lot to ask a 15 year old or a 30 year old in a room full of your peers who's trying to maybe make some decent impressions on people. So I had 10 pretty brave students this time around who when I asked that of them, they were willing to show some vulnerable undersides. So thank you, the 10, for having done so. And without further ado, I'm going to bring up our first, write, our first writer today, whose name is Meredith. As you go, guys, would you mind, when you take stage, just saying your name briefly before you get into it? Ready? OK, would you mind welcoming Meredith to the stage? <laughs> Thank you. 
Dear Harold, as much as I have somewhat enjoyed this two-year love-hate relationship we've shared, I can tell it's slowly coming to an end. You should know, it's not my choice. This is all on you. Maybe you can't help it. You weren't always like this. Slowly, day by day, you've become weaker, more needy. I've put in so much time, effort, and money forth for you, receiving little in return. I don't mean to sound completely ungrateful. However, I have, on some level, been your sugar mama for the past two years that I've called you mine. Just last month, I paid for your new shoes, and now you're demanding more. Do you really need a new set of speakers and a new mirror? It's always something with you. We'd go over a small bump together, and you'd completely blow a gasket. And I would strain myself to fix it for you. And remember the day that I got my driver's license? I took you to Target. You waited in the parking lot, and when I came back an hour later, you started up with a fit of violent shaking and fussy whining. But I didn't really care then. I was so grateful to have you. Over time, these cycles of sporadic outbursts became more frequent, and I basically had to push you into getting some professional help. <laughs> The specialist said that there was so many problems with how you function, and that the time we had left together was going to be short, and that I should make good use of the few miles I had left with you. We've had some fun times together, and even though you haven't always been good to me, with your money-sucking needs and random spurts of complete uncooperativeness, I can honestly say you will be missed. You were my first, and you'll be fondly remembered. You will forever be my 1998 Chevy Malibu. <laughs> Rest in pieces, Meredith. <laughs>
or you spent the whole day driving a bus full of disrespectful people. <laughs> so I see where you're coming from and I totally sympathize. But refusing to give me a transfer? Sure, I'm just some teenage kid who gets on the bus with a horde of flesh-eating zombies who have just finished seven hours of classes. And coincidentally, we all want to socialize with a middle-aged adult about as much as a squirrel wants to socialize with a fox. <laughs> and yes, you do have power over us, seeing as you are in control of this massive vehicle, and we are all relying on you to prevent the crash that would be inevitable if one of us was in that seat. So was it a power move? Or is it actually in the manual that if someone forgets to ask for a transfer when they first board, they cannot receive one later? And now I have to play twice as much as I usually do to get home. I'm sure Metro Transit would be proud. You just made an extra 175 off a high school student. <laughs> when we reached the transfer stop, you watched idly as a kid, handicapped kid tripped and dropped his overstuffed backpack. It burst like a malfunctioning firework and papers drifted to the ground like feathers everywhere in a five foot radius. This created a very successful roadblock placed directly between the horde and our goal the exit. We quickly transformed into helping mode and commenced shoving papers into the bag. Just as we had the pathway cleared of essays and physics homework, you decided you'd had enough. The simple, concise announcement was made. You had your chance and you didn't get off, so you're coming with me. <laughs> I believe the technical term is kidnapping. <laughs> Not the most successful kidnapping though. I mean, really, you, you drove us to the parking ramp where they keep the buses. <laughs> we all know where it is. We all know how to get back. You just managed to scare a bunch of kids. But why'd you do it? Did you expect us to show more respect towards you because we were younger? Could you not sympathize with a kid who accidentally dropped his stuff? Was it just some misunderstanding? Or had your two-minute patience limit been surpassed sometime earlier in the day and when you were forced to wait one more lengthy minute in order for some kids to get off the bus, it put you over the edge? I'll just let you know that the word somehow got to one of our teachers who happens to be six foot eight <laughs> and looks like he spent the last few years of his life in a gym. Not only that, but he will always put up a fight for what he wants. I've literally seen him tear a pen in half when a kid tried to do his math homework with it. <laughs> and today, he interviewed everyone who had been on the bus yesterday. And then he left to run some, an errand of some sort. I wonder where he went. <laughs> What's that? We have a new bus driver today. <laughs> Good luck job hunting. Gabe Delgado. My name is Samantha Martin. Uh, dear person in my head, I have had you in my life, specifically in my head, since I was five years old, and I wasn't sure what to think of you. You've helped, me, you've helped guide me through both difficult times and times when I wasn't sure what to do. You are, you are like a book that opens, up, that opens to the exact page I need to tell me where to go next like the auras I have warning me of a seizure, I sense that you were there to steer me in the right direction. Why do you understand me more than I understand myself? You're like a GPS mapping out a course for me to lead me through life. Remember my first prom person in my head? There were some challenging moments, things that confused me. I was having a lot of fun. Then, boom, everything exploded. I only remember that I was dancing with my friends and my legs started shaking and I felt like I was going to have a seizure. I ended up having fun in the end. You helped me feel better. You convinced me to go back out and dance some more, even though I ended up going home early. You were there for me as I waited for my ride home. Then, person in my head, there was that time in Montana when I went camping with my friends. I watched as some of them started to roll around in the mud, and rolling around is an understatement. 
They were actually throwing mud at each other, face planting themselves in the mud, and ultimately tackling the others who didn't want to get muddy. That's when you urge me to just go ahead and join them. Thanks, person in my head, for, for, for doing that. What a great memory. How do you do this, person in my head? Are you able to see my future? Can you reflect on my past? If you can see the past, can you see the mistakes I've made? Can you keep me from making the same mistakes in the future? Why, person in my head, can no one else see you or, or hear you? Is it because you're a part of me? Or is it because you choose not to be seen? Could it be that, you're, that you are afraid to get in people's faces to be noticed? You confuse me, person in my head. I know that I am just as confusing, though. Do I confuse you, too? I hope that you will stay with me through the person in my head. You're always there for me. Do you want to be my friend, person in my head? Oh, wait, you already are. Person in my head, do you love me just as much as I love you? I think you do. Actually, I know you do. I love you, too, person in my head. I hope we can stay together forever. Thank you, person in my head, for everything I have said in this letter and the many other things I could not list because this letter would never end. <laughs> Love, Samantha Martin. Hello, I'm Molly. And this is to the owner of art and architecture. The other day, I walked into your antique shop. The RC Cola machines and eclectic collection of doorknobs felt oddly familiar. But <laughs> to be honest, being a teenager and not having the space to put the furniture mitigated my interest early. My father and his girlfriend, Carrie, we're holding hands, rooms behind me. My little sister, Frances, was by my side. She was getting antsy as well. And by the time we got to the very back room, the library, we were ready to leave. But something about that room was intoxicating. We had to push past rocking chairs and empty crates but we got to your shelves upon shelves of books. The dust made me sneeze, but the books, some dating back over 100 years, pulled me closer. Before we noticed, an hour had passed, and we were surrounded by books. Being an IB student in the midst of testing season, I had little time for recreational reading. In fact, I had almost forgotten about books entirely. Suddenly, I was cradling a pile of them in my arms, breathing in that aged smell. A book on medical practices from 1910 and an Oxford textbook on the history of India, complete with pictures, come to mind. Dad and Carrie arrived with raised eyebrows. Time to go. Francis and I swayed side to side like seasick tourists getting off a cruise ship. All my new friends were without prices, and after hopping over more empty crates, we walked back to the front. At the front counter stood the clerk. We'll call him Jerome. He looked at our pile, and all of a sudden, he looked constipated. That's because the books were not priced for a reason. Hadn't I seen the sign? We walked back to the library, and he looked at the door frame. Oh, huh, that's weird. There used to be a sign there. Nevertheless, those books aren't for sale. Jerome looked at me as if he were asking, if you were at a grocery store, and there was a baby that wasn't priced, would you take the baby? <laughs> This is a bit embarrassing, but I didn't leave your store with a smile. Instead, my eyes were bloodshot as quiet tears slipped down my face. The idea of all those books without a real home made me sick. 
That's no way for those books to live. Sitting on those shelves, collecting dust, even if I do find the dust endearing. And if you do read them, just how many do you expect to finish? There must have been at least a thousand books. And if you plan to read all of them, how many will you reread? Sir, have you ever seen animal hoarders on TLC? <sighs> Those animals need a home where they will be loved. And my beloved Oxford textbook is suffering the same neglect that puppy number 67 is at the house down the street. <laughs> that is why I'm asking you to reconsider. I've stashed my pile of books where I could easily find them, and I'm begging you to stop holding them hostage. If I had stolen those books, you probably wouldn't have even noticed. But then, I would only be rescuing a few malnourished puppies, while hundreds are still starving in that charming little room. It may be difficult to say goodbye, but it's only fair to sell them. Think of the authors of all those books. Would they want their life's work hidden on a desolate shelf, possibly to never be read again? Or would they want those books to continue to circulate and find owners that would read them and learn from them? I can only hope that we're on the same page. <laughs> the next move is yours, my friend. Sincerely, a concerned customer. Hi, I'm Chris Hoagland. I don't know what day it was, but for the purpose of sounding like someone who is more familiar with his own timeline, let's say that it was August 8th, 2010. That sounds right. On August 8th, 2010, at approximately 10.30 p.m., I was smoking. I was smoking my third camel light in that sitting. I had reached a point where smoking was no longer producing any sort of, sort of pleasure. I could no longer taste it, only feel it in my lungs. I was waiting for my friends to get off work. Sitting on a bench on Main Street, I watched Lake Superior dance under streetlights, lined with drunken tourists in floppy hats and sweaty t-shirts. From that spot, I could see the whole town. I could see everything, but in turn, I couldn't pay attention to anything. Which is why I was so surprised when this man approached me. He was not physically attractive. He looked as if he was either an old 25 or a young 42. His skin had a thin yellow look to it, like the wallpaper surrounding what was once a portrait of an indoor smoker. His face was long, his jaw hung loose from its hinges, his teeth pushed his mouth forward in a Neanderthalic fashion. He silently pointed at my cigarette. I gave him one. His first words escaped with his first drag, an introduction, but I can't remember what he said. I don't remember a word he said, in fact, up until the point when the conversation took a bizarre turn. He pulled up his sleeves to reveal a spattering of cigarette butt-sized flower petal burn marks. I was disgusted. I asked him why. He nonchalantly told me that he likes to burn himself because the adrenaline hits him a good five seconds before the pain does, giving him a short period of clarity to think about his actions before facing the consequences. When my friends got out of work and met the outlandish man, they laughed at him. They whispered, let's throw rocks at him. I felt bad but I also felt almost dirty for even talking to him, so I joined in. We picked up fistfuls of the rocks that littered the streets of our beach town. I missed him, on purpose, knowing my friends would tease me only for my bad aim. He ran, dove into some bar. Later, by the fire, they drank and laughed while I silently held a lit cigarette a centimeter from my wrist. I pictured the skin beneath it peeling and curling into a rose petal. I imagined it would be beautiful, but I could not bring myself to hurt myself that way. And for that, I came to admire the man. When the fire died out, I remember the hotel that he had previously pointed out to me. I waited there for him to stumble in from one of the bars at closing time, but he never came. I will most likely never see him again. I will forever wonder what he would have told me had I asked him how. I often think back to this man and envy him for how he allowed himself to accept pain, to gain pleasure for it. Some believe that with great pain comes great beauty. Some believe that pain opens the gateway to pleasure. Hi, I'm Elena. Uh, my piece is entitled Security. 
I never sit up straight. Being a lady and a dancer, you would assume that good posture is laced into my spine. This is not the case. My curved back is here to stay. But boy, am I plastered to a pole right now. Old people that I don't know mill about the open room. And in this corner, I can't see the picture boards or the video montage. More importantly, I can't see her casket. I found a safe place to dig my nails into my palms and smile at the half moon dents left behind. Balancing on the chair's pleather cushion with the posture of a damn princess, my mind floats to Jack. Jack would know that I don't want to be at this wake. Jack would sense that if another creased mouth tells me it's sorry for my loss, I'll scream. Jack wouldn't judge me just because my body's numb or because I'm watching the leaves outside the window shimmy in the summer breeze. I grew up with a constant ally in my ama. She was the kind of grandma who bought the box of Lucky Charms just so that my chubby fingers could pinch the marshmallows out. There I could avoid the drama of the outside. Um, her apartment became my safe place. There I could avoid the drama of the outside world. There I could just hug her miniature frame or hold her glassy hands or listen to her tell about line dancing with my papa years ago. There I could play my white stripe CDs as loud as my headphones would blast. In fifth grade, I found myself the only 10-year-old at their concert. This was the blossoming of a seven-year love affair. As I've grown up and my obsession has unfolded, I've had the quickest answer to teen magazine surveys. What's your favorite band? The White Stripes. If you could marry anyone in the world, who would it be? Jack White. <laughs> when Anna had a stroke a few weeks ago, my mom went to stay with her. With my dad on a lengthy business trip, it's been my first experiment in complete independence. I've spent the last month on my couch clutching a mangy teddy bear, watching a White Stripes documentary, and waiting for a death letter. Now that it's come, his lyrics echo through my mind as I sit in the wake. Some kids dream of fairy godparents. Others pray to a savior, wait for Superman to swoop in. Me? I cling to anything that feels like home. Perched on my chair, memories of Amma start the pounding behind my eyes, so I close them and think of Jack. Strumming his guitar, his music feels safe. My Amma is gone. The sunshine attacks the trees outside the window, but in my corner, Jack White sings, and I'm choosing to hear nothing but that. From Apple Blossom by the White Stripes, come and tell me what you're thinking, because just when the boat is sinking, a little light is blinking, and I will come and rescue you. Thank you. Hello, um, I'm Carolyn Dussault. Dearest, darling oak tree, the night we met I swayed from room to room wearing an electric smile. My thoughts were similar to that of a child, but you thought, without my ego thinking for you, that I was close to twice my age. Standing together in the kitchen, you grabbed my hand, shook your head in disbelief with simple laughter. I told you, I'm a restless voyager. There's no certificate stone or ceremony that will plant me, shouting out, only stupid people stay in Minnesota their whole life. <laughs> we sipped on admire, addressing the green vine charm St. Paul neighborhoods have, but shortly after, we both overdosed on awe, speculating how many heads my mantra would turn if she had wisdom her to tuck behind her pale ears. The first half of the night, I spoke too much truth. If I was observant, I should have caught on earlier. I might have presented myself with more of an open mind, laughed and asked what you thought instead. If I was observant, I would have seen right away, you are an oak tree. You looked like the true Minnesotan man. Brown buzz cut, pale winter skin, gray hoodie, classic loose jeans, thoughtful but careless. I remember you were shy to answer questions right away. You sunk deeper into the grimy couch, scratching your scalp, probably contemplating where to start. I waited until you let your green leaf smile shift to colorful autumn shades of confession. You started with your high school days, reminding me of age, but no with no flavor of condescension I could linger on. You said you too were a traveler in those days. New school each month said that each time you laid your seeds, they landed next to weeds, and before you could mature, your roots were ripped out and sent to another school, only hoping for more seasons to pass before the next trip. I wasn't sure what to think. I knew there were missing details, but I wanted them to reveal themselves. 
who laughed and smiled, switching rooms and socializing with others. Then without goodbyes, we parted. I left, you stayed. Weeks later, I came back. You reopened by explaining your family, brother, sister, lack of father, and your dear mother. Nothing overly charming. You offered me background, vague memories of smiles, but even more vivid, the upset. Everyone started together, helping out, shared dinners and holiday wake-up calls. I could tell you found this necessary, but not what you wanted to say. You mentioned traveling again. Said there was a period where everyone in the family traveled, including you. That was all right when you were all young. You began to focus on your mother, her sickness, wanting me to understand she needs someone to rest beside her. You turned your chin down and muttered that no one else stayed. Brother, sister, father, all chronically restless voyagers. While mother tonight is down the street, dearest mother, you said you needed to be her oak tree. I sat in silence and this time you waited. Subjects changed, nights shifted, but we had many evening conversations after that. You knew I would soon leave the state, and I knew you would stay. We had met, but soon again would become strangers. So this is goodbye, hoping only you know you forced me to see why staying is okay. And maybe someday that's what I'll do, but before I go, let me tell you, dearest darling oak tree, you would be stupid to ever leave Minnesota. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Maria, and this piece is called Dancing with God. The first doctor told me, I think it's stress. Go see a therapist. The first therapist told me, you're fine. Go see a different doctor. The different doctor told me, I think therapy might be of use here. And at some point, I just said, fuck you. An odyssey of doctors later, I found the one who said, you have Lyme. Lying there on the table, I couldn't help but cheer. I didn't have the energy to do much more than that, but getting an answer was one of the best moments I would have for a very long time. As a child, I felt fate was a dance with God, and my part was simply to follow. But being diagnosed with a chronic illness challenged that, as I was hurled into a violent tango. He still led and I still followed, but now he was the predator and I the running prey. We swayed in and out of this clinic or that while doctors called out seemingly random predictions of six months or a year at best. Disillusioned with doctors, I found my way to the fringe where a channel welcomed me into her practice. Whatever you believe about the validity of channeling, it was she who first looked me in the eye and said the words half a dozen doctors hadn't been brave enough to utter. You're dying. I tilted my head slightly and agreed. My body was shutting itself down one vital function at a time, organs and limbs refusing to obey both my motherboard commands and the emergency programming of dozens of new medications. She watched me with steady eyes and asked me the one question no doctor had mentioned. Do you want to live? People have life or death moments while lying on operating tables or in the minutes after a crash. But in my moment, fully awake and breathing, with a woman sitting in an easy chair across from me, I could only wonder who exactly was leading this dance. In the absence of some great divine hand swooping down to suggest the next step, it was clear this dance might be mine to lead. So I said, I think I'd kind of like to live. She smiled at me, told me to close my eyes, take a few breaths, and begin my healing. I have no idea what happened in that room, as she called on different angels of all orders and wrapped me with colors of lights. Perhaps. Nothing happened, or perhaps it was all in my head. And yet, in the next few months, I began to improve. My energy started to exist. I couldn't function normally yet, but I was able to read three sentences and remember the contents of the first one by the time I had finished the third. I scheduled another appointment and watched my physical capabilities come back, allowing me to return to karate and all of my physical joys. 
Over the following year, I returned to full health, but I still wonder about following and dancing with God. I no longer feel like prey, but I don't think I'm following anyone either. I'm leading my own dance, and God can follow if he'd like. You guys hustled so hard last night. Wow! If you didn't get the gist in listening to their stuff, this workshop was centered around true stories, so real experiences from their lives. That genre, creative nonfiction, is the practice of kind of Rapunzel-like spinning art from your real mundane experiences. So this is a, this is a story uh, that I wrote about having some trouble sleeping. I was a really first-rate sleeper as a kid. I could sleep through earthquakes and fights and everything else. And then uh, growing up, had a harder time staying asleep. And uh, I'm a pretty rational kid, so I was kind of reluctant to head the new age self-hypnosis route and finally caved after I hadn't slept for a few days. <laughs> it is 4.23 in the morning. And I am at the top of the beautiful, stupid staircase in my head. Three months ago, during a trip to the dentist, I realized that I needed a staircase. I arrived late to the appointment, struggling to contain the contents of an overburdened manila file. I opened the door with my hip, while my right hand operated independently to check all of my pockets in a futile search for my cell phone. The receptionist kindly accepted my little bow of apology and waved me in. I go to a low-income clinic for artists, where I seldom see the same dentist. This means that the Novocaine talk must be had anew on every visit. I looked into a pair of large brown eyes above a paper mask. I have a pretty incredible tolerance to Novocaine. <laughs> this presentation is infinitely preferable to the converse formulation, which is, I have a terrible sensitivity to pain. <laughs> well, I'll keep that in mind. I didn't believe that this new dentist would keep that in mind. I believed that she had forgotten it already. I'm a relatively slender young woman, and so dentists are reluctant to dose me as I would like to be dosed, which is as an elk calf. <laughs> the dentist began to prepare what I presumed to be a grossly inadequate shot of Novocaine. And partially reclined in her padded chair, I regarded a magazine page taped to the ceiling. It featured a sandy sweep of ocean, a tropical dental getaway. But I do not like to pretend that I am in Mexico when I am receiving medical attention, <laughs> even just for fun. <laughs> the dentist administered my shot, the hygienist attended to her shining instruments, and we waited for my face to go numb. Sensing the opportunity, my mind immediately shut off. It flipped through the remembered contents of my calendar, it called out approaching deadlines, then scrawled a harried to-do list whose items ticked past too quickly to read. My mind, which I used to consider a great ally, has turned into a sparrow on a leash. A crazy, ambitious, unblinking sparrow with red kaleidoscope eyes and amped up on cocaine. <laughs> it keeps me up at night. It talks over my phone calls. It strains towards the next task even before I'm finished eating, before I'm out of the shower, before I've properly greeted people or put the car in park. And more troubling, it seems to like me less and less. The dentist revved her drill. All right, let's give it a try. After 30 seconds of cautious drilling, I flinched beneath her. You're feeling me, uh-huh. <laughs> something cold or something sharp? I moved my hands. You're not sure. OK, hang in there. She refilled her syringe and talked me through a series of injections. OK, now I'm going to walk the needle backwards a little bit here. Good. Breathe for me. <laughs> In the midst of the fourth shot, I wondered how much farther she'd have to sink the needle to get the sparrow. And after a few sore minutes of waiting, we were able to continue, this time quite confidently. The dentist dispensed with her former delicacy and chatted with the hygienist as if they were alone in the room. The drill sent up little clouds of tooth dust. I felt the numbness advance unevenly across my face, the way that armies advance across a map of Europe. The numb took over the left side of my nose but could not bridge the septum. I felt it overtake the outer edge of my left eye as though I was blinking someone else's lid and it occurred to me that I had asked for too much Novocaine. 
that perhaps I was getting brain damage. <laughs> but I just couldn't drum up much concern. I was painless. I wasn't late for anything. <laughs> and the vibration in my jaw suppressed any real rumination, quite possibly in the midst of a chemical lobotomy. My only definite thought was, it feels so good to lie down. <laughs> That's when I knew that I needed a staircase. A filling appointment is not supposed to be the most tranquil part of the day. <laughs> and I resolved that as soon as I left the chair, I would start studying meditation or mindful living or eating flax seeds or whatever it took to dial down. I resisted the staircase method in the past because it seemed so new agey. People who put themselves to sleep by envisioning their descent down a mental staircase are people who confer great agency to crystals. There are people who read books about spiritual healing with covers that feature pastel drawings of shapely fairies and prayer. Yet, here I am, in the early hours of the morning, atop my very own flight of brain stairs. <laughs> Self-hypnosis is sort of like trying to perform a card trick on yourself. The talking part of your brain must convince the rest of your brain to go to sleep, the dear person in my head, without seeming too calculated. It has to seem very casual. The details of the process vary, but my narrative goes something like this. You are standing at the top of a beautiful white staircase in the middle of a golden pond. You will descend this staircase into the iridescent... <laughs> so it goes. Very deliberate, very controlled, as I effectively drown myself to sleep. And although it's nearly foolproof now, it didn't work right away. At the beginning, when I felt myself drifting, the thrill of success would snap me back into full consciousness. <laughs> or I'd get impatient and I'd take the steps too fast. And then when the water was at my shoulder and a little voice of panic would start to speak, saying, this is not working, this is not working. <laughs> Before my staircase, sleep seemed binary. I was doing it or I was not. But now I've become familiar with the gradations of consciousness. On the very first step, I am impatient, hyper-aware of every itch, unhappy to be on a staircase. On the second step, I am better able to f actually focus on the parts of my body that are asked to release. Between steps three and four, I find that my mind has taken a little unauthorized vacation. Just a sweep of nonsense, maybe in the flash of a remembered conversation or a brief visit from some imagined third party. This recognition is usually enough to fully reinstall me. I continue. But then with the water at my waist, I find I have lifted my foot, but I can't remember where to put it. Or I find that I have been standing still for what seems like a very long time. At that point, I have only a few remaining moments of lucidity. In truth, I do not know what happens after that. Presumably, my limp body tumbles down in the slow motion of an underwater fall. I lie at the foot of the stairs for hours. The current lifts my hair. Far away, other climbers roll down their own staircases and hit the bottom in a little plume of soft dust. I remain crumpled, breathing slowly, until a pair of divers arrives to lift me to the surface where another day is breaking. And perched on the dry landing above, my sparrow looks on, waiting. Thanks. I got A's. You got Q's? Does anybody have any questions about how we did this? Is that true? What was the hardest part? Yeah. How did you come up with the person that you wrote about? How did you come up with the person that you wrote about? And is that to, um, to kind of everybody on stage as a general question? I'm going to hand this to you, Carolyn. Um, I guess for me, uh, something that after time of like knowing that like for my life, something that I will always be as a writer is that like I find a lot of beauty in really small connections with people, people that aren't like your family members or who you call your best friends, but people that maybe you know you won't know for very long. And there's just something about them, like a conversation that made you realize something, like this man that taught me that it was okay if I didn't go all around and sometimes it's nice to be by family. So for me, I just look for like 
the people that I didn't know very long. Something that struck me from someone who's kind of a stranger. And then just to reiterate, everybody wrote, when they said I, you know, in the story, that was really them. So these were all true stories. Um, can I have someone explain what an open letter is? Uh, an open letter is basically uh, writing something to either like a sarcastic or funny, it can be to an object um, or to like a, like a dead person or like a, maybe like many people do like dead authors um, or things like that. But um, it's just kind of a way to just kind of like do sarcastic writing, just like to make things funny or something mm -hmm. like that. Uh, for, and I say this in all sincerity, but when I started really liking this genre, creative nonfiction, my dad said, well, what are you going to write about when you're 16? You know, what are your true stories that are going to be so interesting? And one of the things that we did in this class is that open letter where you write to a person or an object who's probably not actually going to read your letter. And that's a device where you're not actually depending on like a great story or a great plot. You know, you're writing with your attitude. You let your style kind of carry it. I'm going to give this to you and you're going to feel the next one. Any other no. questions? Questions? This question right Um, okay, this is loud. <laughs> I know that something I struggle with with writing is like sharing something so personal. Is that anything you guys have ever felt? And if so, how did you overcome it? Because I thought you all did an excellent job performing. Um, I know that some writers use like their work as kind of a form of release and like getting something personal out there in a way that um, is kind of objective. Like no one can say, no, that's not right. It's like how you feel and it's kind of something creative that you've put down, I think that's a really good way to get personal stuff out there. And it may be uncomfortable at first, like writing things down and getting your thoughts out on paper, but um, I think it's a really cool experience to have, to see like all the thoughts in your head, like concretely on paper, to share with someone else in a way that is maybe less stressful than saying it like with your words. Yeah, can, yeah. We, can we go, can we, let's, I'm going to pass it to Maria and then to Dorsey because I feel like both of them had stories that were really personal, you know, so I can see that kind of concern. Um, the story that I wrote is actually not a story that I've ever told before, so I know what you're saying. Um, but what I thought was when you allow fear of what other people are going to think or judgment or that it feels too self-indulgent or whatever, when you let that prevent you from telling your story, then it disowns you from your own history. And so there's a point at which you just have to, you have to own your past, your history, your stories, whatever it is that you've done. And I think for writers, one of the best ways we can do that is just to write it and to share it. And yeah, it's scary, but it's, it's your heritage. It's part of who you are. And so I think it's really important to claim that. Um, so I can definitely see where that's coming from because that is especially what I was writing about um, it's definitely it was definitely a worry on my mind especially and I mean also like it was kind of strange at first because especially when we did like the editing and stuff like you're writing about something that happened to you and you know you're still kind of emotional about it and everything and like people are you know I don't know it's kind of strange at first but Kind of like Maria was saying, you have to just kind of work past it because if you have all these walls up and stuff then you can't really truly express how you feel and what happened. So you just kind of got to let it go and you know, it's, it's good stuff, so yep. <laughs> There's also sort of the figure skater effect. You know when you watch a figure skater and they stumble, like you want them to do well so badly that I think it, that, that effect is hard to underestimate that it's like, <laughs> that happens quite a bit with like people sharing scary stuff in, in creative nonfiction. You just want them to win so hard, man. Um, I have a question about tone because all of you had a really unique tone. I mean, some of you were really bitter, like the story with the man in the city and the story with the, your um, 
encounters with disease. And I was just wondering, did your like tone change while you were writing your story? Or was this really how you felt when you experienced this event? That's an interesting question. Gabe, do you mind fielding that one? Uh, I, like to, I like to sort of change my perspective on things when I write. Like, when my, my story, I'm just sort of mad at this lady who, you know, on the bus. But I, I would never, in my head, I don't tell the story the way that I did on paper. I like to change it. I like to, to have a different perspective and sort of set the tone in a new way that I haven't looked at it yet. I don't know. It helps. And then also, I actually have that problem a lot when I'm writing stuff for school. I, my tone and my perspective on things develops a lot as I'm writing, and so it can become really convoluted. Uh, with creative nonfiction, I've found that you're working off of memories, which can be kind of difficult, in that your memories can kind of shift while you're writing it. Um, Isabel Allende, she's an author, she said that she thinks of um, your memory as kind of like foggy images that you can never really fully grasp. And I think that's just definitely something you have to keep in mind while you're writing and try and rework it as you go to make sure that you're being consistent and that your, your simplest thoughts are getting across. Um, yeah, I don't know. Did, does this question apply? It was so, uh, uh, people in the room, forget the camera. Um, <laughs> the question had to do with the tone in your piece, is that actually the way that, the, the kind of attitude that you had when you were having that experience? I worked, Chris and I worked together one-on-one -on -one a little bit yesterday talking about not only how to write it, but then also how to present it, particularly the pacing. Well, yeah, I think it's different for my piece because there is a change of tone, but it's apparent, and it's because my friends came and they pressured me into, or they wanted to do something that I went along with. I, we threw rocks at the guy. That's a true story. That, that was a change, because before then, I, I, I mean, I didn't understand him, but I definitely was connecting with this guy. And, but then, obviously, when I go back to, and they all leave, I'm still intrigued. And that actually is how it went. So the, the story is the same as the retelling. That's how it felt. But it could be different for someone else. Can we do one more question? I was just going to say one more question, I think. For the story with uh, the person in your head, what are you relating to with that? Will you repeat the question one more time? With the story, from, yeah. From the story with the person in your head, what are you relating to with that? Okay, um, I just have. It just seems like sometimes I don't know. It's like this little this little thing in my head just kind of gives me advice, I guess, and sometimes will like encourage me to do things and it's not really like a something you can see really it's just like a voice and it's just like telling me to I don't know it's like and t like the times like the prom t like when I was at prom or when I was in Montana it just kind of encouraged me encourages me to do those things and do things that maybe I'm not I'm not really comfortable doing it just kind of like it's just kind of like a person there kind of fish yeah just talking about the person in her head my guy that's what she's talking about. <laughs> okay, I know that we're, we're short on time, uh, or we're at the end of our time. Thank you guys, you killed it. You did a really, 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 really great job.